And hello, hi Sam, how are you doing? Hey Conrad, I'm doing very good. Uh, how are you? I'm good, thanks for asking. <laughs> um, so Sam, as our resident copy editor and proofreader, um, I thought and we thought it would be great for you to share your story with our community, um, to share some, some of your best tips and tricks and wisdom um, about all things copy editing, proofing and copywriting. Mm -hmm. So I thought that the best place to start would be right at the very beginning, <laughs> day one. What was, you know, where did you first, your love for words first come from? Okay, um, first of all, uh, thank you for having me here. <laughs> it's really cool to be here. Uh, usually I'd be viewing your interviews with other people and now I'm here, so that's cool. Um, yeah, so where did it begin? I think it was always part of me. So when I was a toddler, I was hanging out a lot with my grandmother, who was a retired uh, English literature professor. And she would read a lot of like stories to me. And, you know, I was already into Greek mythology before I even started school. And when, once I started school, you know, English was my favorite subject. I joined Scrabble Club. When I was eight, I joined this um, short story um, competition and I miraculously won. So that was my first published work, like Sweet Valley and then Nancy Drew. And then I progressed to more serious literary works like the works of Sylvia, Sylvia Plath and um, F. Scott Fitzgerald and Haruki Murakami and, you know, these uh, these people really helped me develop my own personal writing style. Yeah. And, you know, I also started writing for the school paper. And then by the time I was in university, I was, uh, I had my own live journal blog, which was a trend back then. So for the younger people you listening, to... for the Gen Z, so Tumblr and live journal were, yeah, were really popular back then before, before Facebook. And all that. Day. So that's when a blog was kind of the original sense of the word. Yeah. Right? It was yeah. when a blog was literally like an online diary or journal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I was writing about my interests, like film and fashion. So that was really how I started. Yeah. Amazing. Cool. <laughs> it was a bit weird there. We had a bit of a tech problem there. You froze, but then it sped up. So we got, all, we got everything in. Um, okay. Basically. You want to uh, to redo that? No, 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 no. That's all. That's okay. Fine. Yeah, we're we're in. we everyone knows that we're in the COVID situation. <laughs> we have to do interviews this way, so all good. Um, okay. So, do you want to do you want to talk about your um, journey into copywriting? Yeah. So I started, I think, ten years ago. So. <laughs> Uh, 2010, a year before graduating from university, the first thing I did was write film reviews for a film website in the Philippines. Mm. Uh, and after graduating, so so I studied film, so it's not really you know strictly related to copywriting or advertising, but I, I like to. I studied philosophy, so also <laughs> good. yeah, Connected so in some ways, but not in others. Yeah, yeah, so. Anyway, I was really interested about uh, in the script writing side of, of filmmaking. So my first job was as a copywriter, but it was for like a cable channel in the Philippines that showed American reality shows, mm. um, such as Keeping Up with the Kardashians and Jersey Shore and RuPaul's Drag Race. Fun stuff, <laughs> really high quality shows. Uh, and I had to write video scripts uh, for voiceovers for these, um, for the trailers of these shows. So yeah, so I started writing uh, things for television, for video. Uh, and then after that, after I left that job, I did some fashion writing. So I was uh, a contributor for a fashion magazine in the Philippines. So I was writing fashion and beauty articles. Can and I was I, also editing. Can editing. I butt in and yeah. can I butt in and ask how and and you know again I don't know if things 
exactly how the job market is in the Philippines. Yeah. But how did you land those jobs? How did you get your first copywriting job writing, you know, um, voiceover scripts and things like that? And, and then uh, the second one. Yeah, so it was really funny because I had no, you know, solid copywriting experience because I was only a student back then. But I tried to like produce a makeshift portfolio out of my live journal blog entries and the film reviews that I was writing for that website while I was a student. And that's what I showed them uh, in a job interview. But I think what really helped me land the job was like acing the writing test. Because I think in copywriting, it's not so much about how good you look on paper, but it's mostly about the skills you can you can deliver, what you can bring to the table. It's more practical. So uh, in that aspect, I think that's, that's what really helped, you know, get my foot in the door in, into the industry. Yeah, Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think that, um, as you know, the chat we had with um, John Ashton, you know, yeah. was that applying for a copywriting job, the best thing you can do is you know, write good copy in your email for starters, and then, you know, yeah. have a portfolio that we can look at, even if it's, like you said, things that you've written personally, you know, some copywriters have applied with us and given us a few samples and then samples of their own poetry um, and, and things like that. And, you know, so that, that, that does help to sway us. It helps us make a decision because if you can really see mm -hmm. the craft, their, their skill set, then that's really what we're looking for. Um, more than necessarily a ton of experience. But anyway, keep going, because I, I yeah. butted in there, so keep, <laughs> keep telling your story. That's all right. So yeah, after my stint uh, in the fashion magazine, um, I went back to writing for television again, but this time uh, it's in the entertainment side of things. So. I was interviewing celebrities, you know, visiting film sets, um, asking them about things going on behind the scenes, then doing write-ups. Um, yeah, that was really fun because I got to meet a lot of, you know, um, personalities that uh, I was just watching on television when I was young. So, yeah. Um, and then after that, um, I started writing in-house as a senior copywriter for a beauty and wellness brand called Human Nature in the Philippines. So it's similar to Lush uh, or Neil's Yard, that kind of brand. So, and that really helped me a lot when it comes to like B2C e-commerce writing as well. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, but then I left the Philippines after that to pursue my master's degree. In media and communications in Goldsmiths University of London and then after finishing that uh, yeah I had to restart my life in London <laughs> so but still I landed a copywriting job after that uh, uh, I was again in-house and this time for a career coaching company and then after that yeah um, I'm I was hired by TCP and I'm now the content editor and here you yeah. are, and now we're yeah, here I am uh, after ten years. <laughs> Amazing, yeah, um, yeah, really interesting story. Like I'm a bit mm -hmm. jealous of some of the gigs that you had when it came <laughs> interviewing celebrities and getting to watch Jersey Shore and <laughs> <laughs> which, as Forget. you know, we like a bit of, we like a bit of trash TV. Um, yeah. So I'm going to not follow the scripted questions and I want to touch on something that you already touched on there, which is B2C. I will get back to them, don't worry, but B2C um, copy, you know, writing for fashion and e-commerce. Yeah. Is there anything that, you know, any tips that you have for, for that particular style of copywriting, writing for that particular industry and how does it differ to writing for B2B or for the tech industry or other other industries okay so when you're writing for fashion or you know lifestyle btc it's not just about selling a product it's about selling a lifestyle so you need to put yourself in the shoes of uh your audience you need to speak their language you need to think about the things they think about um you need to identify their problems and come up with solutions so not just about using the right words that would compel them. Um, 
let's say, for example, Adidas. So I've written for Adidas, and we all know that, you know, with Adidas, you need to encapsulate the spirit of competition and sportsmanship, and that needs to translate into your copy. So there has to be like certain words that you're using, like say ready or, you know, um, fueled by in order to make the copy stronger. And when it comes to other fashion brands, you also need to be up to speed with current trends. Um, I mean, you need to know what color blocking means or say the difference between magenta and mauve or turquoise and royal blue. Because, yeah, it might come in handy for, for whatever you're writing. So I guess those would be my tips. Because with B2B and uh, tech, it's more like humanizing difficult terms, jargons. Um, so I think that's the main difference. It's more, it's less about humanizing the tech and more about putting yourself in, in the shoes of your audience. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that, yeah, even more so than kind of B2B copy, it's like painting that lifestyle, that dream. Yeah. You know, trying to, and there's often like a really strong central theme to mm. the brand, like you said, with Adidas. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, I was talk, talking about Red Bull recently, where, you know, at the end of the day, Red Bull is an energy drink, right? It's a drink, and we don't just talk about the features like the ingredients of the drink in fact their you know their brand is so strong because they've honed in on this this sort of lifestyle of yeah. extreme sports and uh, pushing the boundaries and things like that so if we were writing for them we'd be using those kind of words to yeah. to really yeah make that kind of core theme come to life mm -hmm. um, not fashion but b2c anyway but I think there's yeah. a, a um, crossover between different b2c industries yeah. Um, cool. All right. So I want to look at the or talk about the copy editing side of things. Okay. What would you say? Because obviously you edit a lot of the copy that we uh, provide our clients. And, you know, you, I suppose you're editing the copy of different writers for different yeah. industries um, a lot. What, what do you say are some of the sort of biggest mistakes that you see writers, copywriters make? Um, I would say um, long sentences. I, I see a lot of long sentences, run on sentences, and, you know, missing punctuation marks. And I can understand where that's coming from because I'm also a writer and I have the tendency to just follow my train of thought. And when I'm really immersed uh, in a certain subject or in, in whatever I'm writing, I tend to just focus on that and sort of ignore the more technical aspects of, of what I'm doing. Um, so that's that's one common thing. Another thing is um, with the nuances. Let's say you're a writer, you're, you're a writer in the UK, but you're writing for a US audience. Sometimes there are certain expressions that are used in the UK, but aren't, you know, used in the US. So um as a as a content editor you kind of need to uh fix that so that um to make sure that you know the, the audience can grasp uh, what's being said there yeah i think that's a tough one as well because yeah. it's tough because i suppose as copywriters one of our the main one of the main things that we do is use what we call real talk right yeah. conversation yeah copy it works conversational copy resonates but a lot of um you know one of the ways that we make copy more conversational is by using common phrases yeah. um which uh, in many cases might be local phrases or, or yeah. phrases that are uh you know you hear all the time because you're immersed in a certain uh country or you know yeah. britain Britain, for example, would be slightly different to the US. Yep. Um, and it might be hard to know what is British and what is American. Yeah. Um, have you got any tips for that, for overcoming that challenge? Uh, yeah. I can only speak from a personal point of view because for me, I'm able to differentiate them because like, uh, I've, li I've been living here in the UK for five years, so I'm very familiar with the colloquialisms and the expressions that are common here. 
as for the U.S. side of things, uh, because in the Philippines, uh, American pop culture is, you know, right. And it's something that we encounter almost every day. And it's also highly, you know, integrated in our own culture. I'm also familiar with that. Plus with, you know, TV shows and movies being predominantly American. Uh, that's, that's how I'm familiar with it. So I guess because I'm familiar with both sides, uh, I'm able to, you know, um, sort of find a middle ground to uh, edit certain expressions and colloquialisms to fit um, each demographic. So you sort of innately know, or you, if, is it, what, okay, I'll ask you a tough question. What about if you're not sure? Is there any way of kind of checking? What if, the, what if there is a, a colloquialism that you're just not quite sure about if it's UK, US? Um, well, first you can always Google it, but I think it's also helpful to have Grammarly um, and it's free. And there's an option to, you know, edit using US English, UK English, Canadian or Australian. So although it's not perfect, let me emphasize that Grammarly is not perfect. You still have to go over everything. It helps a lot because it identifies spelling errors quickly and even, you know, punctuation errors. So it's good to like have that on the side besides, you know, Googling or using your personal experiences to determine what fits best in the context. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I think Grammarly is a massive help. And, and like you said, Googling, I, yeah. I do a lot, to be honest, but I'm not quite sure, even yeah. on the US spelling as well. You can yeah. Google it will usually say just in Google where, where, yeah. where British or American or both. Yep. Um, so that's a good set segue to kind of talking about, um, I don't know, any tips for copywriters starting out? Obviously, in most cases, especially in our community, uh, we'll, they're looking for, we'll be looking for freelance work. They won't yeah. have a copy editor or a mm -hmm. proofreader necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, so any tips for them, you know, for people editing their own work or that process of, you know, writing and editing and sort of separating the two? Okay, so there's this popular statement wrongly attributed to Ernest Hemingway called um, write drunk, edit sober. And that's, for me personally, that's very effective. So I would suggest, you know, just pouring your heart out on your first draft, just write relentlessly, follow your train of thought. Or if you think you're not that organized, write an outline first. Make an outline first and write your first draft. But when it comes to editing, that's when you have to reassess everything, like go over the content. Does it make sense? If it doesn't, um, what will make it better? So. Do you need more points to support your argument? Do you need references? Do you need to interchange paragraphs? Do you need to make sentences shorter? Is it too wordy? So you have to ask yourself all these things, then edit according to that. And when you're happy with the, uh, with the, the edited version after that, the last step would be to check for spelling and grammar, grammatical errors. and that's where Grammarly could come in handy. Um, then after you've gone over the content and the technical aspects of it, uh, go over it two or three more times, just read from start to finish. And once you're 100% happy with it, then yeah, then I guess it's ready. Perfect. Um, so you're saying that we should get drunk. Yeah. Then write, <laughs> then sober up. And then, yeah, uh, I guess write with your heart, but edit with your mind, you know. Exactly, yeah. I really like that phrase. Mm -hmm. uh, both of those, in fact. So, yeah, and so, yeah, it's such, a, it's such a crucial part, isn't it? Like, the editing process. I think in our course material, we really try to drill that in, that it, it, that, that, that process is really necessary. Don't be a self-editor um, as you're writing. And I struggle with that to be honest i really do me too <laughs> like i'm such but a after all these years i struggle yeah. same, <laughs> same, same for me yeah and, and that's why um you know dictating is one way that i get around that 
um, writing even in my Evernote on my phone. Sometimes I find that's it's almost like or or writing with a with a pencil in a in a scrapbook. Yeah, I do that a lot. Yes, yeah, scruffy handwriting because you can't really edit. You can go back and cross, you know, put lines for it, but it doesn't yeah. really work. So you're it. It is harder for you to self-edit. Um, yeah. And I say, when I'm on my Evernote, like, you know, lying in bed at the middle of the night, get some ideas and start writing stuff, you know, I'm much more likely to just let it, um, you let those kind of unleash those words onto the page. Yeah. So, all right, that's, that's editing. Any tips specifically to proofreading? Because you talked about this kind of staggered process there writing drunk or at least pouring your heart onto the page yeah. then editing which involves several rounds and coming back with kind of a fresh lens fresh pair of eyes um looking at it in a, in a different light on a different day even and then and then and then the proofreading is like an extra layer on top of that right yeah yeah why is that separate to the editing would you say editing is more content based it's like assessing the essence of what you've written. If yeah. like you agree with the points you've made, if everything makes sense. Proofreading is more technical. You know, you're looking at grammar, you're looking at spelling, you're looking at punctuation marks. So I guess that's what sets them apart. But I would also like to add to that, that in terms of editing and proofreading, it's better to ask other people to look at your work as well. Because it's very, very hard to proofread your own work because you're so invested in it. It's too close to home and you might not see certain weaknesses and shortcomings that uh, your work may have. So, but if there's someone else who would look at it, then it would be more objective. Um, that person could have a different perspective or different insights about the writing style. And that's always helpful. And constructive criticism is also going to help you become a better writer. So, yeah, I think when it comes to proofreading, it's, you know, it's, I recommend uh, asking for the help of your friends or people, people, you know, people close to you. Yeah, exactly. Your, your other half, if you have one. And yeah, I think it's, it's so important. And I find it really interesting that no, like, and this is something for, for our newbies to yeah. know. Sometimes, and I remember when I was starting out and I was right, starting to write copy and content for businesses, it was very important because I was starting out. I wanted to impress them. I wanted to get my portfolio. I wanted to get everything perfect. But sometimes I just could not spot a typo, even if I'd read that piece, you know, 10 times. Yeah, um, and it's so interesting that that some typos you just can't spot, and I think it's because you're so you're you're reading for the meaning so much, yeah. and you're so used to writing it that um, it's very hard. You kind of glaze over those little mistakes because you're really yeah. kind of immersed in the in the content, as you said, behind it. Mm -hmm. um, so I suppose getting someone else to help, very very good move, very good advice. Yeah. What about if you are, are there any tips? Because obviously you're often you're proofreading others, but you also need to proofread your own because you also write copy for our clients and for our, our yeah. blog and, and our own materials. And again, a lot of freelancers starting out, um, you know, if they don't have the opportunity to get someone to read their own work, do you have any tips for proofreading your own content? Um, yeah, so I think, what I've mentioned before would be helpful for starters. Just like check the content, then then check for spelling and grammar. But also it's helpful if you have like, so if you don't have friends that you can really ask, it's good to have a community online um, that where you can share your written works and you know, other people can take a look at what you've written, and comment on them. So it's sort of similar to what we're having here at the Academy. Um, Perfect. Nice little plug yeah. there. The <laughs> but, but really, because um, I wish I had that when I was starting out. Um, I think, well, I sort of had that through LiveJournal because you're writing blogs and then, you know, people can comment on what you've written and you can also do the same. Um, 
and other blogs. So it's important, I guess, to find your uh, your niche, your, your community. It doesn't necessarily have to be a physical one. It can be an online community. Even You can even find it through social media, you know. When you write your Facebook post or when you tweet something or when you post something on Instagram and you see a pattern um, when, like, say, certain posts get more engagement, and then you can analyze that, okay, this kind of writing style works for me because people are attracted to it, people interact with it. So maybe this is the sort of style I should go with for like, you know, for other written works. Yeah, perfect. And yeah, I mean, as we know, we built this community for a reason. And yeah, yeah if, you're, if there are other people who are going through the same journey and starting to get out that into the big, big wide world and you know look for copywriting gigs and that's why we set up the kind of uh the power groups um you know share share it with each other if you've got a buddy could be like a proof proofing buddy help each other you know proof each other's work and 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 we're we're all in this together Um, i want to i want to add one thing that suddenly popped to my mind Mm -hmm. which is a situation when i find that typos often occur, typos or grammos, as you can call yeah. them. It's, it's often when you have, yeah, it's after editing a piece. It's after editing, um, let's say, just a couple of lines. For example, you write your piece and you've read it through, and maybe you've read it with fresh eyes on a new day, yeah. um, and you're, and you're sure there, and maybe there are no typos, but then you get a bit of feedback from someone, whether it's uh, a peer or, or, or the client or, or someone else, and you just change a couple of sentences or part of a sentence. Yeah. That's often, I find, when something will slip through because you know, you're just changing part of the sentence and then suddenly two words don't connect or the grammar doesn't connect yeah. or, or there's something left there and you haven't reread it completely. You've just thought, mm-hmm. oh, but it's because you, you just think you're just tweaking one little bit. Um, so that just popped into my mind. I don't know if that will help people, but it's, it's something that I've noticed. Yeah, that makes sense. And I also think sometimes you're either overconfident or overanalyzing what you've written. And both can be detrimental to the final result. Because if you're overconfident, you tend to be like, oh, you know, uh, I'm a great writer. I won't have grammatical errors. This is good enough. And when you overanalyze and you over scrutinize each part of uh, of what you've written, then yeah, well, same as what you said, um, it's also prone to grammars. Yeah, exactly. Because you're you're looking at it from a different perspective, right? Yeah. You're really focusing yeah. on the too much. And I would say that some clients are sort of forgiving and lenient and you know understand that typos can slip through but some aren't some some Mm -hmm. really aren't and some will see and it's really unfortunate because in my eyes you know a a good copywriter I mean not not spotting your own typos I wouldn't say is like a a really really bad trait I think it's quite hard to avoid Um, and I think that when we're looking for like a good copywriter, that doesn't, that's not a to- at the top of the list yeah. by any means. But unfortunately, some of the clients that you're dealing with, uh, especially when it's small businesses and, or I don't yeah. know, marketers in marketing departments, they might not see, see that in the same light. You know, they might, they might see a typo in the first draft and think, well, this isn't a copywriter. A copywriter should be someone that can provide completely sort of flawless um content with no spelling mistakes or grammos or anything and and, you know and it might sever the relationship it might they might even say well actually we don't want to continue because they're perhaps focusing on 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 that side of things rather than on oh the fact that this copy is really compelling and it's going to convert and it's going to really express the brand and the storytelling etc so it it is a really important thing to try to iron out in some way or other, whether, whether like we said, it's working with a buddy or, or, or let's say just sharing it with your, your partner or your, or your friends or someone to really proof it. Um, and one little extra 
tip, which I think we met, mentioned in the course materials, and if not, here's a freebie for everyone. Mm -hmm. A little extra tip, if you are proofing your own work, is you, you can actually change the font just while you proof it. So it's kind of like you're forcing yourself to look at it with, you know, uh, a, a new lens, buy for a new lens in a certain way. Just change the font, even to something like weird or different, like Comic Sans and just, <laughs> yeah, our favourite, right? Comic Sans yeah. and, then just, and then read through and, you know, and it kind of, again, it's like when I used to paint um, and you're painting and I used to kind of draw and try and get likeness of someone's face, mm -hmm. uh, you get so sucked into it that it's very hard to see it from a fresh perspective. So one trick that we learned was to look at, at it in a mirror because it reverses it. It's kind of the same, yeah. but the opposite or, yeah. or look really far away because again, you're just looking at it in a different way. And one way to do that, I guess, with copy is a different font. So it's a, a little yeah. extra trick. Um, but I want to go back, back, loop back to copywriting and what, what would you say is the, if you can think of this, the most useful piece of advice that you've had that really helped shape um, how you now write copy or how you sort of, yeah, how, how you change direction perhaps in your, in your copywriting? Okay, so when I was starting out, I used to be really flowery and my sentences were really long and I used, you know, really highfalutin words and I guess when you're writing academic papers, that's fine because you need to make it to the 6,000 word count. Um, but if you're copywriting, it's different. you have to keep because you're not writing for, you know, scholars or um, literary enthusiasts. You're writing for your audience. And the most important thing is for them to resonate with what you've written and for them to relate to it so that you can convert them. And so if there's a way to say something simply and concisely, you just have to go with that. Cut out all the fluff and focus on what's important. I think that's, that's the most important thing, thing yeah. I've learned. Yeah. 100%, yeah. And I'd say that like, maybe long form content like blog posts etc okay. maybe maybe you can be slightly more flowery <laughs> just yeah. a tiny yeah. bit especially more. when you're storytelling at the start yeah, yeah. stylistically exactly. but yeah but just tone it down when it comes to like highfalutin words because you're not really here to you know um showcase your vocabulary you want yeah. people to you want to hook your readers you want to make them read uh, what you've written. So, yeah, you just need to really resonate with them. Yeah, completely, 100%. And, you know, your readers are busy. We're all busy. We're busy people. <laughs> so, and with short attention spans, and that's why yeah, yeah. the whole kind of choppy, you know, one thought per sentence type thing. Yeah, yeah that's one thing I learned from you, actually. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah. It really makes everything more digestible and easy on the eyes. So, yeah. I'm, I'm a bit of a sort of, yeah, I'm like the long sentence police in a way, as, as you know. I'm, maybe yeah. I'm a bit aggressive with it, but um, I think it's just a great, yeah, it's a great tip. It's a great piece of advice. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So uh, one, one last question for you, Sam. Um, I think that would definitely be interesting to some of the people in our community. We've had some okay. questions about this. Obviously, you told us your story. Uh, yeah growing up in the Philippines. And so you're, you, I know that, you know, uh, the English language in the Philippines is, is, is used a lot and you learn it early on yeah. in school and, and, and everyone in the Philippines or, or many people have very good level of English. But I suppose not being an originally a native English speaker, how, you know, what challenges have you had and how have you overcome them? Because I know there are a lot of copywriters and some in our community that aren't native. And they, you know, they have that question. Can they be a good copywriter, even though they're not a native level speaker? Yeah, I think so. Because in my case, in the Philippines, so we sort of learn English the same time we learn Filipino. So it's the first language in a way. Plus in school, um, 
the medium of instruction is English, as in our homeworks are in English, our papers, our final exams. Um, even at work, you know, we speak in English. We only really speak in Filipino conversationally with our friends and family. So it's sort of like natural already for, for me um, and for most Filipinos. When it comes to writing, um, yeah, definitely you can be a good copywriter even if you're not, you know, American or, or British or a native English speaker. Because um, I guess you learn it along the way. If you really love writing and if you want to connect with as many audiences as you can, if you want to go global, you'll really try your best to communicate with everyone and learn the language on a deeper level. And for me, I was able to do that by reading. You know, it really helped me uh, expand my vocabulary. It exposed me to different writing styles. And then also being, being a go-getter, just putting yourself out there, even if you don't have experience in writing, just volunteer and grasp every opportunity. And that's how you learn to really be a better copywriter, not just a better, you know, English speaker. So it kind of goes both ways. Um, on, on the one hand, you have to be willing to learn. On the other, you have to do something to, um, yeah, to become better at what you're doing. You so, be really proactive. Yeah. 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 I think some non, you know, native uh, speakers are, have a better grasp of the language than a lot of us uh, mm -hmm. native English speakers, just because, especially if you're really interested in language. Yeah. And have, you know, uh, my mum, for example, who's originally from Poland, is just got just amazing with languages. And, and yeah. because she really studied them and was so interested, she, you know, she kind of lear learned the grammar rules and can talk about English grammar uh, a lot better than a lot, of, <laughs> a, lot of, oh, a lot of my mates, for example. Yeah. Um, a lot of like non-natives as well. They might not sound English, but when it comes to grammar, colloquialisms, and nuances, if they get it, then it means they can be an effective copywriter. Because yeah. when you write, you don't really need to talk, right? Uh, it's more about, yeah, the, the quality of writing. Exactly. And I'd say I'd loop back on that note to the fact that, uh, or the advice we gave, that it is very, very good idea to send your copy out to other people. Like, especially if yeah. you're not 100% sure about certain phrases, colloquialisms, whether you're, you are a native English speaker or not, either way, you don't know if how that phrase or that sentence or that paragraph is gonna sit with people. You don't really know. You can only kind of assume based on your own knowledge and, and skills. Um, you don't know if something feels a bit off or something doesn't flow well. Yeah. So it, the more people you can send your copy to, the better. Exactly. And so I think that's why surround yourself with people that are willing mm -hmm. to do it. And maybe if there's a, some kind of reciprocal arrangement there, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. All right. On that note, Sam, thank you so much. Really, really valuable advice. I hope our community take these tips and go away and like use them essentially um thank you thanks a lot yeah thank you conrad um, yeah it has been great <laughs> awesome and we'll see everyone in the community